I appreciate him not here to share them. I'll get him later, but he has three services to get through. Why don't we take a moment real quick before we get started here. I just want to pray for your pastor as he asks for prayer as he's out there ministering at City Church, is it? City Life Church? Father God, we thank you so much for the man of God and the woman of God of this house. We thank you for their yes. And as they go forward, Father, and as he ministers today, may he articulate your heart, your will, your nature to those who would listen and impart the wealth of knowledge and the word of God into their heart that they might be transformed and impacted and changed. Give them the grace and the energy as he ministers to each of these services and each of these people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated. Well, it's been fun. I've been enjoying this worship. Awesome worship team. I thought, man, we could just stay there. Why do you need the word when you have worship like that? So really appreciate that, uh, feel at home. And uh, just as we're getting to know each other here, uh, we had the privilege and honor of meeting uh, your pastors maybe about three years ago at uh, Cornerstone there in Toledo. And uh, since then, we've just look, been looking to build. They were out there in Philadelphia with us. They took a train ride over and uh, we spent some time in Camden at the aquarium. I don't know if you remember that. And we were just hanging out. and and uh, being a blessing and building with them. We just, uh, we try to like lean into and spend time with people we feel like are dyna dynamic, anointed, and just people that know how to be good friends. Amen. Yeah, in, in fact, I did a, I have this podcast called the Cool Christian Nerd Podcast, and uh, I did an interview with your pastor, and it was called, uh, it was on the Friendship Zone. And so we talked about what it is to have friends in ministry and how much we need those. And he was gracious enough to be on that with me. And so I just honor them. I love the way he is so teachable, um, and, but has so much wisdom. And how, much, how many know that that's a sign of wisdom is your ability to stay humble and teachable. And so he just carried that so well. And so we just love to be on the phone with each other and exchange. What are you learning? What's going on? What's happening? Just enjoy their perspective and their family and all that they've done in our lives. And so I'm just want to say that here. Um, a couple of fun facts before I get into this word because we're getting to know each other is I've been married for guess how long? Uh, 23 years. Yep, yep. So just want to say that because you might be thinking, aren't you 23? So, so I know, I get that a lot. So 23 years, and in fact, uh, some more fun facts and things that might blow you away, if you could throw that picture up there at whatever point. I have a family of five, so we have five children. <clears throat> it is my wife's fault, but there's more than that up there because uh, two of my children are married, and so they have their spouses with them there, and I won't point them all out and say all their names. But you can see that cute little baby on my, in my lap. That is not one of our children. That's one of our grandchildren. That's our first grandchild. And so there she is. So just take a look at me and say how that's possible. We're going to talk about that today, how to discover the fountain of youth. I'm just kidding. No, no. So I, I just wanted to show you that uh, our family is awesome. And um, I'm a second generation pastor. Uh, got a couple books here that will be out there if you guys uh, want to take a look. Uh, there's a book called Relationship. Wrote that a couple years ago for our church and our people. And a lot of other people have been um, taking a look at it. It's pretty, it's pretty hardcore, I guess. And it's pretty brief, so men can get th through it pretty quick. That's, that's why I wrote it, so men will, like, I don't read books. Well, it's kind of like a little referral manual. And anyway, we just talk about what it looks like to, what's the courting process look like in these, this day and age where it's all about dating and experimenting and all that other stuff. So uh, my heart is to see a white veil revival. <clears throat> and that's just a picture of when you wear the white veil. There's a purity that you're coming down to that occasion with because you preserved yourself for your I do. So anyway, just talk about that a little bit. Might be good for your teenagers. Pass it on. Uh, and then Take a City just talks about the different things in a city, like diversity and authenticity and the four things you need. It's a, this, I think, is free with a couple, if you purchase a couple things. Um, I, I like this one because it has my beard on it when I had it really long. It's called Milk and Honey, Entering the Land That Flows. And it just talks about moving on from poverty to prosperity 
but in a different, because I, I struggle with a poverty spirit. I grew up in ministry and around those things, but anyway, uh, just, you have to get the book, but I think it's kind of cool, because if you don't have a long beard, you can buy this book. <laughs> Slip it right under your nose, and instantly. Don't need no operations or nothing. It's just, so anyway, milk and honey, entering the land that flows, and then last one is evolution. Moves of God are messy, and so they're out there. And it's just uh, it's a picture of my journey, the things I learned along the way of pioneering a move of God. And so, yes, whenever, and it, it's practical for your own life. Whenever you want to see a move of God, expect a mess. And, uh, and what that mess looks like before he instills and brings order. So good. Well, um, let's get into this. Am I looking at a, there it is. All right, so I want to talk to you about something. Uh, my wife is up front, so could you just stand up and turn around? That's my wife of 23 years. So I just wanted you to take a look at her because uh, she looks innocent. <laughs> and she didn't know I was going to go here. Uh, but before we were married, we were actually in the same youth group together. And we were out there doing, a, there was an outreach that we were actually a part of out in the streets and, and doing some stuff with music and, and drama and hip hop. So we were out there in the streets doing this together, and as we were getting, we got back into the van with some of the group, and I started to tell this young lady that was part of the group, I was very rude and disrespectful to her. And it caused her to cry, and this young lady was a friend of my wife, my, my, it wasn't my wife at that time, uh, and when my wife saw that I made her cry and heard what I had said to her to make her cry, she was like, no, you didn't. Now, I don't know if she took off earrings and put on Vaseline, if it happened that quickly. <laughs> but I just know that some people had to hold her back from getting at me and tearing me up. Now, you know I was arrogant. I was just looking at her like, yeah, whatever. That's because people were holding her back. <laughs> so she, was, she came at me because she felt like I was a bully at that moment, and I was. I was a bully. So people, actually the youth leaders, reminisce about that story. He's like, who would have thunk that you were about to beat him up? And now you got married to him. <laughs> and now she can corner me and beat me up all that she wants. <laughs> so, she, so she was bullying the bully. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. This idea of bullying the bu The fact that your pastor just said you're about to learn about how you need to get into a good fight. Maybe I'll start with a little something here. Um, and again, I'm so grateful for this platform. I know a lot of, uh, there's just so many men, many men of God and women of God that come up here to impart to you. And so I am not trying to out-preach or out-teach anybody. I figured when people get up here, the most important thing they can do is impart. Yeah. They impart a piece of their heart. And if they can impart their heart, if they can impart what they carry, then you're going to be the richer and the more blessed for it. And so I just want to impart something to you today. It might just be for one of you, but I believe it's, uh, it's substantial for what it is that God wants to do in your life. So she, so she was bullying the bully. She was bullying me. And I want to instigate something so that you would today begin to bully those bullies in your life. Those bullies in your life are those things that instigate you and paralyze you from doing things and achieving things and feeling like you're limited and they bully you into believing that you're limited. They bully you, they instigate that you can't do anything or you won't achieve this. And there's been promises that have been made to you, there's words of God you've heard throughout the years, maybe even recently, that haven't come to pass. And what that can do is allow the enemy to come in and bully you as a result of that, that that will never happen in your life. And if we allow it, we can end up being bullied, punked, pu pushed back, and just allow the, non the non-existence of something to determine how we live our lives, and we get bullied, and we get shut down, instead of set, uh, step up and say something about it. Now, I want to uh, 
us to refer to as a, as a scripture. I'm going to just refer to it, but in 1 Samuel 1, there is this particular family that God chooses to zoom the camera in on. And he zooms the camera on this guy named Elkanah and his family who is, uh, uh, but how did you say her name? I know Hannah. He's married to Hannah and Panina. I, I want to make sure I say the name right because you often don't hear about Panina, but you hear about Hannah. So, so they, they zero in on this family and this time in Israel where there's a priest and he has his children. And, and it's, it's a real odd time where the priesthood is not helpful. The, the priesthood is not, doesn't have too much revelation. And, and yet it focuses on this family and the dynamic of this family where Elkanah, married to Penina, has these children. She's able to produce these children. And so it's a picture of her success. It's a picture of the legacy of uh, Elkanah able to live through one of his wives, yeah. Penina. So she's producing these children. And Hannah, in the meantime, is barren. Hannah is not able to give birth to any child. And so Panina begins to bully Hannah. I know you might have thought when we were talking about bully the bully that we might go into just some David and Goliath type of stuff. But I want, I want to take it a different angle. So here is, here is uh, Panina having all these children and taunting her. I don't know how you do that. I, I mean, I could guess in some ways. It could be real rude, like... Hey, let's have our children play together, Hannah. Why don't you bring your kid? Oh, that's right. You don't have no kids. Or, or, or come by, like, look at the gifts that, look at the gift that my husband got my children. What did he give your children? Oh, that's right. You don't have no children. And maybe it was, it was those kind of innuendos, those kind of slights that they, she was making that was just taunting and bullying Hannah because she wasn't able to produce, and in those times it was critical that they were able to reproduce because of the legacy of the family. And so in some ways, that barrenness was considered a curse. So here's Hannah feeling like Penina, the bully, is blessed while she is cursed, the one being bullied. So Hannah doesn't, at one point, Hannah gets just to this place where she needs to say something about it. And so she's at the temple at one point, and at the temple she is in that vicinity, maybe of faith, a, a place where she's meeting with God and saying, I got to say something about this. And so she begins to cry, or she begins to cry out to God. Now there is a, the high priest there, Eli, looks at her and just kind of notice her moving her lips, but she's just kind of pouring her heart out. She's kind of, in some ways, losing her dignity in what she's doing. And Eli confuses what she's doing and believes that she's just drunk. Are you drinking already? It's too early for all that. And so she, in that way, doesn't get upset at the misconstruing of what she's doing. He actually, or Hannah actually, lets her know that I'm crying out to the Lord. I'm believing God for my situation. And at that point, he's so impressed with her reply and, and what she's looking to have that he just says a few words to her. He says, be, peace be with you, and may God grant you what you are praying for. So she leaves that day with this excitement and joy with just what he has said. Here is Hannah in a fruitless in a barren situation, she is fruitless, if, if, if you will. She is barren, and she is in an environment and being in that time of Israel where the, there's a lot of things that are suspect. There's a lot of things that are not, that don't look like they're producing much. And yet she is able to take that word, that seed that was planted in her and spoken by the high priest Eli, and she took that and ran with it. And it said, not too long after that, she was able to conceive 
a child that she promised that she would dedicate to God. She said, I will dedicate, if you give me a child, this child will be dedicated to you. This guy, and this child, Samuel, was dedicated to the Lord. And this child, one of the most powerful prophetic figures, having the priest, having a judge, and having a prophetic mantle on his life was produced through a barren woman who was being bullied but chose to push back and bully her barrenness and bully all the words that had been spoken against her so that she got her womb ready for the seed that was about to be planted. Mm. Because before, seeds didn't work in Hannah's life. And I just want you to consider that do you find yourself in a place where you are finding, why aren't seeds working in my life? Why is it seeing that words are being spoken to me, but I'm not seeing the manifestation of it? That nothing is being conceived from what's being spoken or done. And all I can hear is I'm cursed. All I can hear that I, I'm not like so-and-so, or I can't achieve that, or that's, that's too maybe far in the future that it might never happen. Why do I feel shame and a lack of dignity as a result of having words or seeds not working in my life? I, I like what Hannah does is because Hannah gets to a place where she just applies faith, but in its most simplest form. And I think this is really important because a lot of times we think faith needs to be complicated. And faith is real simple. It's the simplicity of Hannah's faith that she says, God, I just need to know you're in my situation. I just need to know that I am heard by you. I just, I'm just going to bring you into this. This all what it looks like. All this bullying and all this stuff that's happening. I'm just going to bring you into this. So she was real simple with it. She didn't, she didn't get elaborate. She just said, I need to get before God. And if I can get a word from God, if I can get some things restated, if you will, or just get a fresh batch of faith, because sometimes that's what we need, because we, we have faith in one moment, but something is not being conceived or manifest, that we just need a fresh batch of faith, maybe a fresh flow, a fresh whatever it is. And so she gets back and she just gets to that place where she says, I'm just going to bring God into my fruit, fruitless situation. And she begins to bully the unbelief that's trying to keep her barren. Barrenness, I mean, unbelief has a way of keeping us barren keeping us fruitless, keeping our situation exactly what it is so that there's nothing wrong with the seed. Sometimes God needs to just work on our womb, on our ability to receive what it is that he is delivering. And when the simplicity of faith for me is when you get to that place where you're just saying, God, I just need to know that I am not alone. That's it. I just got to know that you're with me on this. That I am not alone. There is something about knowing that God is with you. That he sees you. That he knows you. That he favors you. That he loves you. That he speaks to you. That although the situation didn't change, like as long as I know that I'm not alone. As long as I, I, I just, I, just I, I can get a peace on me. That I am not alone alone because there's something about barrenness. There's something about the promise not being fulfilled that you feel abandoned. You feel like that he's not with you. Because if he was with you, then wouldn't these things manifest? So God, are you not with me? Is that why this is not happening? Sometimes we just got to press in and bully the bullies, those things that cause us not, that we can't believe for something and just hear once again, you are not alone. I am with you, son. I am with you, daughter. That right there, knowing that I'm not alone, is enough to begin to turn something around. Now, uh, when I was starting the ministry in Philly uh, 13 years ago, I remember us getting down there, and uh, we started in 
we, we were about to start into the dining room of our house. We get down there, and I have no job, and uh, so we don't, we don't come into a church. We're going to start a church. So we're, we're going to start this church. We're believing God. We plan for a whole year out. We get there, and in my mind, I'm like, we're going to be fruitful right away. They've been waiting from this word, this word of God. We're here, God. We said, yes, God. Let's get it cracking, right? It's like one of those things. That's how I imagined it in my head. But then when I got there, it didn't happen according to the imagination of what I thought it was going to look like as a result of me being faithful and stepping into that. And so I found myself in my car crying out to God. God, I said, yes. God, I brought my family and my five kids, and some people followed us to be a part of this church plant. Am I cursed? Did I not hear from you? Because nothing's popping right now. There's no facility. There's no people. There's no job. I'm just trying to get crumbs to indicate I'm on the right path, that you said yes to this. And it's been tough, God. And I'm hearing, I'm getting bullied into believing I made a mistake. I'm getting these voices that you, you just, you did it out of ambition. You did this, but I'm, the, I'm like, you know, I got my pastor's blessing and we did, we did all those stuff. Somebody's like, no, 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 you're doing this out of blind ambition. And I'm getting bullied in my car and I'm beginning to cry out, God, what am I doing? I had it so good back when I was in Lancaster and I had two jobs and I had this and that. And I started to rehearse that time of fruitfulness. And then look at the fact that right now I'm fruitless and doesn't seem like I have the capacity to bring anything about. And I just remember, he didn't, he didn't promise me this or that about a church. He just reassured me with his presence that he's with me. He just said, I'm with you. He didn't say nothing about next week. It was going to be this and that. He didn't, he didn't make any of those things. He just said, I'm with you. And I was like, you know what? That's exactly the answer I needed. I just needed to know that I wasn't trying to do something without you. So my success is that I am with you. I am in your will. And as long as that's the case, it's a matter of time before anything else happens. But the surety of you being with me, man, what it did to my faith at that moment. What it, what it produced in me, it produced a tenacity, a stick all those things that unbelief wanted to bully me out of. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, well, let's do this. Whatever it looks like, let's just do this and move forward. And it was, in, it was probably a couple of months. I can't give you one of those stories where it was like, man, then I produced a baby overnight, and the church grew to 1,000 and all that. No, 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 no. It was like people that you, you don't want at your church coming to your church. And this like God said, work with that. Because God is really about working with the seed. There's something about the seed that he wants us to see. So, so for us, I think what happens a lot in us getting to that place of faith is that we, we, we do something. What we do is we get into these situations and how, why we don't address a lot of those things that are causing us to have unbelief all of those bullies is we tend to ignore it when we feel like we can't control it. And so we begin to ignore it or we, it, we, we ignore that it exists and then we start saying statements like this. It's complicated. It's complicated. So, so, so for example, you know, maybe our, one of our kids come up to us like, you know, why is Uncle Joe not married to Auntie Mercy. But why do we call him Uncle Joe if he's not married to Auntie? And what do we say? It's complicated. Because <laughs> we don't want to get into the explanation of all the stuff that's going on there. So just ignore it. It's complicated. Or, or why is the electric off? Why is the electric off? And 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 we got the latest phones. <laughs> and what do we say? It's complicated. It's complicated. I don't want to explain it. I just want you to ignore all this other stuff. Can't even like charge the very phone that we bought. Anyway, and, 
Or why, why is it that some people stay spiritually stuck for two years, sometimes longer, and they're in the same place you found them two years ago? It got a little quiet. And usually we'll say, it's complicated. Now your pastors might not say it's complicated. It's like, it's because of this, it's because of this, it's because of this. They're making it more complicated than when it really needs to be. But we look at ourselves and we look at our situations and we usually, because we want to ignore stagnancy and lack of growth as something that is complicated. It's complicated. There's a simplicity to faith but then we make the mountains in our lives and the things that are challenging our lives complicated. And see, here, here's where I want to turn your attention to something that Jesus did. And Jesus bullied some things. He bullied some things and then taught his disciples how to bully the bullies. You read that scripture about moving mountains. If you say to this mountain, move from here to there, it will move if you just have faith. And so they, we like to quote that scripture and talk about that scripture for our particular situation or that thing in our lives. And we get excited about it, and we should, because we want to see if God has the ability to move impossible things and to deal with impossible things in our lives. So he says, move this mountain. If you say to this mountain, it will move at the sound of your faith. But before that moment that he even says that, it just goes through in Mark 11. It starts with him just walking by, and there's this tree that he's examining, a fig tree, and it has leaves and all that stuff, and he comes closer to it, and he examines it, and it has no fruit. And it's fruitless. And he looks at this fruitless fig tree, and he says, I curse you. And he curses this fruitless fig tree, and you will bear no fruit and all that stuff. And then it's walked away and keeps doing what he's doing. And so when he gets into the town, remember that episode where he starts flipping over money tables and my house would be called? I mean, Jesus is just on a rampage right now. He's like, fruitless fig tree, you out. And then he moves on and he's, he's looking at all these people and what they're doing to the house of God. And he's like flipping tables like, Jesus is a beast. <laughs> I believe these things have to do with one another. Fruitless fig trees, fruitless religious systems. And both of those things he does not tolerate, and he doesn't want us to tolerate because they are, they're skewing God's promises. They're keeping us from knowing God, God being a God of fruit, God of being a God of promises, God knowing what to do with seeds and seeing them grow and reach their fruition. So here he is, he, he does that, they get back to this tree and all the disciples see that this fig tree has withered and he's like this is the this is the tree that you said that to and now it's in this condition and he says yeah let, let, let me break it down for you he says for those who believe and have faith as we learn those who know that God is with them and for them he says not only this but mountains mountains that are in your way I, I believe one of the things that God or Jesus is teaching his disciples from going from a fig tree all the way to a mountain is he's saying these fruitless situations are causing your vision to be blocked. Mountains, although those places they meet with God, mountains can also be vision blockers. They keep you from seeing what's over there. They're vision blockers. They're, they're these hulking hindrances in our landscape that keep us from seeing the future that God is leading us into. And he says the reason why, it's almost like I've got to deal with this fig tree, this fruitless situation, because it's, it's blocking your vision. And if you can get rid of fruitless situations in your life. You can get rid of things that are blocking your vision in your life and move those things out of the way so that you can move forward. And he says, I know mountains can be a complicated thing. He says, all you need is the seed. All you need 
is the potential of my promise. And what I need you to do is how you steward that seed, how you take that seed and you apply it to a situation, how you use that seed, if you will, to bully the mountain. He says, this is what the seed of faith has the ability to do. You want to bully some mountains? You want to get rid of some fruitless situations? Take this seed that I'm planting in your life and begin to bully those situations. Bully the unbelief with the promises that I put in seed form. And a lot of what God gives you is just in seed form. It's not the fruit, the full fruition of it, but what are you going to do with it? Is your life a womb which can receive the seed that has the potential of bringing the fruit to get you to the vision? Is that too much? I know it's a complicated way to get there. But what I wanted to show you is how simple it is to move forward and how complicated we've made it. We've made mountains. We've given such esteem to the things that are not happening in our lives, the things that are blocking us from getting where we need to get to. We've made these relationships that haven't been resolved mountains. Yet God gives you and says, can you just take this seed of forgiveness can you just take the seed of reconciliation? Can you just take the seed that's the nature of who I am and apply it to that mountain of dysfunctional relationships or relational rift? Can you just take this, this seed of, of truth, what I want you to do with your, maybe your finances or the things that I've given you, and take this seed and apply it to the, apply it to the kingdom in the way that I'm asking, it, asking you to it? But God, I'll never own a house. I'll always be renting. You're describing mountains instead of discovering the potential of the seed. And he says, man, if just you know I am present in the seed, I'm in that place where in the, with the seed, it's almost like you've got to die to some things, some past preconceived ideas of how you view certain situations and take this seed and let that something in you has to die so the thing that I've given you can live and if you would just crack the shell of that seed and let it sprout in your life obey just just trust me in it that's what you want just trust me with the seed I know it doesn't make sense when you look at your mountain and you look at these fruitless situations but take the seed trust me you're not alone in it Trust me, I've given you this seed. I've given you this word. Peace be with you. And by this time next year, there will be the manifestation of it. That's so impressive about Hannah. That Hannah took a simple seed that was spoken by Eli. He was a man of God, but in some ways it was a little shady if you really get the backdrop on Eli's story. But she was like, you might be who you are, but this seed, this word, this promise that you, you released to me, I'm going to do something with that. I'm going to get excited about that. I'm going to cultivate that. I'm going to let the doubts die based off of that seed that I just received. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the unbelief be pushed out, and I'm just going to rejoice. And it says the next year, here comes Samuel. Here comes Samuel. Sometimes God has something in store for your womb that's bigger than what you think. And this sometimes, sometimes the attack that comes against you is trying to prevent that thing from ever being birthed. So the seed wants to get there, and the womb just needs to be prepared for the seed and the fruit that's going to come. Because the Samuel that's about to come and the promise that's about to come is about to destroy all the vision blockers, all those things that are preventing people from seeing Accurately, Wasn't Eli a blind high priest? See, here comes Samuel with a perspective and a revelation of something. And he came through what was once a barren womb that was under attack. But that a woman of God was willing to bully the bully of unbelief and push it back and get to the place where she needed to be. The temptation is to ignore it. It's to ignore it. And we don't see how things can change. You know, I, at one point, I, I believed that I would never be able to be used prophetically. And uh, 
there was a time that I was asked to minister at a church uh, in Philadelphia, and it was kind of a, a youth setting. And so I was just praying, God, I'm going to this church. I would love to hear a word from you that would be helpful to them if there's a prophetic word, just to show that you care and that you love somebody out there. And so I heard the name Gladys, and that's it, the name Gladys, and that something about a prodigal son. That's all I had. So I get up in front of, and, and they're primarily, a, a, they're bi, it was a bilingual service, but they're primarily Spanish. I get up there and say, okay, let me, let me try out this word. Let me try out this seed that I got. So I put it out there. Is there a woman named Gladys? When I looked out there, there was only a few people, so the chances of there being a Gladys was really slim. <laughs> but I did it anyway. So I threw Gladys out there, and man, what I got was crickets back. There was nothing coming back. I was like, well, let me pronounce that again. Glad is there a Gladys here? And they're looking around, and eventually so somebody says, well, there's a pastor's wife. Her name is Gladys, but she's not here. I'm like, okay, well, maybe that word is for her. Amen. Would you just, and then I, I have a little dialogue, and then I keep it moving. And so a couple weeks go by after that service, and it was a good service, and a couple weeks go by, and then they get me connected with Gladys, and it's a pastor's wife and she only knows Spanish. So now I'm on the phone, and I'm being bullied again. Like, I was being bullied for the first time, but there was no Gladys in the room. And now I'm being bullied again by the fact that you only know Spanish, and I'm supposed to give you a prophetic word, and I, I, I sort of remember it. And so they put her on the phone, and then I just said, let me just drop this on her and just be faithful with this seed. So I start to talk to her, and just stuff starts to come out, and, 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 and I release it, and all of, again, I hear crickets. On the phone, I hear nothing back. And I'm like, is that okay? And then I hear. And then the husband gets on the phone, the, the pastor, and said, your word was right on point. I was listening as well. Our son is backslidden. And you were talking about that. And you, you, I was saying that he will come back to the Lord. He will serve God. I was saying all these different things. And uh, she was so moved. And I was like, yes. Amen. I did what I needed to do with the seed, and I was so encouraged. I was like, I can't believe that worked. I didn't get bullied. The story ain't over, though. A couple of months later, there's a lady that starts coming to her church. We find out that her husband is struggling. And a couple of weeks later, he comes to the church. And he is so moved by the service that he, in fact, he can't even stay. He has to leave. He, he leaves. Some people corner him and start praying for him and everything. He comes back and he answers the altar call and gives his life to Jesus. And while he's there, we find out that he has this huge drug addiction and it's been tormenting his life. And he's a bas backslidden pastor's son that's married to this young lady. And we investigate the story more and find out the very son that I planted the seed in this mother about is the son who got saved at that service in our church and I couldn't believe it I just thought I was planting a seed I didn't think I was going to see the fruit and I saw the fruit he is still with us today him and his wife serving with us and that was about 7-8 years back powerful moment I'm just trying to show you that there's sometimes seeds that come to us that are unimpressive. And it's about us having this womb that's willing to believe and know that we are not alone. Because there's a vision that God wants us to see something, but these fruitless situations are causing us not to see beyond these mountains. And like I said, I don't know who I came here to encourage, to talk to today, but I want us to take a moment, just if we could just close our eyes in this place and just take a moment for you, Holy Spirit, to finish off what you started. Father God, we just bless you and we honor you for this time that we're here gathered. We feel your presence in this place, your presence that reminds us that we're not alone. And God, while many of us might know that, some of us can think of a situation right now that has been aggravating on how fruitless it's been, how stuck that situation is, how impossible it seems to get beyond that. And Father, I pray that a seed was planted in their heart today to begin to believe again to believe that you are 
with them and for them. And the reason why there's such a adversity or fruitless situation is sometimes because the potential that is in you to produce something substantial and transforming for the future is being bullied into unbelief. And today, Father God, it's time to bully back. It's time to push against the bullies in our life that are keeping us stuck in our fruitless situation, blocked from the vision of the future. So as you're hearing me today, I want to take a moment. If you felt like God was speaking to you about a specific fruitless situation right now in your life, that's just, you hate, you just want to ignore it. You don't even think about it anymore. You've moved on. It's been so many years, and it's just remained the same. But today, but today, you're hearing that there could be something more if we give back the simplicity of our faith, that seed that bullies the bully in our lives. And you would like prayer for that. Would you just raise your hand? I would love to pray for you in this place. I see your hand. I see those hands. Amen. I see your hand. I see your hand. Amen. Why don't we do something? Why don't we all stand to our feet? Thank you, Lord. We want to remain in a situation where this is holy ground. This is a holy place. Those of you who raised your hand, I just want to bless your courage for that moment. I just want to zone in a little bit as you, just to pray a prayer over you. Because it is not easy. It is not easy just seeing something stay the same for so long to believe it can be other, anything other than what it is. It's so hard to believe that that parent, that that relationship, that that spouse, that that coworker, that it, boss, man, it ever changes. It's so hard to believe that you could feel nothing other than just a depression or anxiety or this sense of loneliness. It's so hard to believe that joy can be yours. Those are those fruitless situations that crop up in our lives and make us feel like that situation, or maybe it's us, that's cursed. And today, I just want you to, to know that is a lie. It is a lie. It is a lie to keep the fullness of your potential barren. So in Jesus' name, I pray for all those who raise their hand today, Father God, that you have sent a message to them that there is a seed that's coming their way. There's a seed that's coming their way, and they will be impressed with it that they will take it and they will plant it where it needs to be planted in their hearts of hearts, Lord God. And they will choose and speak according to the seed and not according to the situation. That they will plant it right there in their heart, in their lives, that it will bring back their joy, it will bring back their praise, it will bring back the potential of impossibilities becoming possible because of your presence and your involvement in our lives. So Father God, I just pray they sense your nearness. You are with them, that you are for them, that you speak to them and you've located them even this morning so that mountains can be moved and fig trees that are fruitless can be withered up so that they will begin to see and manifest a different future. We bless them, Lord God, and thank them for today saying yes to the seed that was being planted, the seed of hope, the seed of a different future. Right now, I pray that God begins to change the landscape of your mindset, paint a different picture on the canvas of your heart and mind of what it is going to look like in the future. Yeah, and then you would just trust that it is him that has spoken it and doing it. And we just say, we give you permission that what in us needs to die so that what you have planted can live. We say yes to it, Lord God. We say yes today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen to God.